anyone could tell you that having more muscle is going to make you stronger, make you less frail, maybe make you burn some more fat. But I want to get into the bioenergetics and the true metabolism piece of this. What does having muscle do for our longevity outside of just helping us with glucose or helping us uh, prevent frailty or handling a fall? Like, How does it actually help us become stronger internally, human beings that can live longer. Let's go ahead and break it down. Number one is the increase in mitochondrial density when we resistance train. Now, hear me out on this. When you get bigger muscles, that's one thing. That's gonna create some more mitochondria simply because the muscle's bigger. But what people don't realize is that muscle has an energy demand, right? If you're carrying around more muscle, that muscle is going to require energy that energy requirement is going to trigger an adaptation for more mitochondria, simply to function. So now you have more mitochondrial density that's gonna compound. The bigger a muscle gets, the more the energetic demand, the more mitochondrial density you have to have. So what is mitochondrial density? Mitochondrial density is the amount of mitochondria in a given cross-sectional area. So more density does not mean dense mitochondria. It means a denser cluster of mitochondria. There was a study that was published in the journal American College of Cardiology. It took people with chronic heart failure and it had them do simple leg extension exercises and it had people that did not have chronic heart failure do simple leg extension exercises. Both of them saw an increase in mitochondrial density, but those with chronic heart failure saw a 25% increase in mitochondrial density. Why does that matter? Well, because when you have some kind of metabolic condition or heart condition, mitochondrial effectiveness or efficiency and density is gonna go down. So what this demonstrated is that to prevent or recover from any kind of metabolic condition, resistance training is hugely important, possibly more important than cardio, which is what's interesting. Next up, we have mitochondrial biogenesis. So number two is you have more biogenesis. What does that mean and why does this matter? Mitochondrial biogenesis is the birthing or the creating of new mitochondria. Okay, and the more exercise that you do, the more biogenesis you have. So you can see, again, it compounds more and then you get more. So then you're stronger and you produce more and you produce more. It really almost seems as though it's infinite until myostatin kicks in and you can't build muscle anymore. There's a study published in the Clinical Journal of the American Society of Nephrology that took subjects that had chronic kidney disease. Okay, and in this case, had them do 12 weeks of resistance training or a control. Okay, what they found is that those that ended up doing the resistance training had a significant increase in mitochondrial biogenesis and an increase in what's called PGC1A, which is what stimulates mitochondrial biogenesis. What does this mean for you? It means that you are equipping yourselves with the systems to restore and build new mitochondria. This doesn't sound important until you have a problem, until you are at a point when you get sick and you need the extra energy, right? We don't realize that the mitochondria produces energy not just for life and for walking around and lifting weights, but for everything, for fighting off things, for protecting us when we're sick or run down. Like It is our energy factory. So having more mitochondrial biogenesis potentially protects us and gives us sort of a little bit of an insurance policy. Number three is the actual production of ATP, the ATP production capacity. So essentially, your mitochondrial efficiency. How much energy can you produce per milligram of muscle that you carry? So it's one thing to have 10 pounds of muscle on you. It's another thing to have 10 pounds of muscle that can produce a lot of energy. So with this, we look at a study published in the Journal of Applied Physiology, and it found that those that resistance trained ended up producing more ATP per milligram of muscle than those that didn't. And those that did more resistance training had even more than those that didn't do a whole lot. So the point is that the more resistance training you do, the more efficient your mitochondria gets at producing the actual energy itself. What this means is there's something called the respiratory control ratio. That is how much oxygen it actually takes to turn ADP into ATP and produce energy. What they found with this is that the respiratory control ratio improved. So less oxygen was required to produce energy. It's kind of interesting how it's like a, uh, an opposite inverse reaction. It's like the more mitochondria you get, the more efficient they actually get. So you resistance train, you build muscle and you become ruthlessly efficient at creating energy. This is gonna protect you in so many different ways in addition to, of course, putting muscle on you and keeping you lean. The next one is one of the most important ones and it is the electron transport chain efficiency. So when you eat food, 
you have electrons. These electrons go through what's called the electron transport chain. They go through complex one. So basically an electron like almost drops down these multiple stories in a mitochondria. But the most important phase of this is between what is called complex one and complex two. And when an electron drops between complex one and complex two, it creates like a big energy explosion sort of thing, right? Now, a lot of times that energy ends up kind of expanding out and causing problems with reactive oxygen species or oxidative stress. So the sheer converting of food and energy into actual usable energy creates exhaust. So there's a study that was published in the journal Medicine and Science and Sports and Exercise that had people do 12 weeks of resistance training and it did a muscle biopsy before and after. And they found that afterwards, there's increased protein abundance in complex one and two, meaning that there was more stability. It was a safer place to be able to produce energy with less risk of it kind of evacuating. This means that there were more proteins available for NAD production. So NAD, you've probably heard in the longevity space before. It is absolutely required for enzymes to function and required for survival. The long story short of this is that this leads to more NAD, which leads to more energy, which leads to more efficient energy manufacturing, which leads to less oxidative stress, which leads to potentially less disease and less fatigue and ultimately even more fat burning through weird mechanisms that aren't really talked about that often. So essentially you have more NAD available. That means you're gonna have more NAD to actually convert white fat into brown fat or rather liberate white fat to be burned by brown fat. What does that mean? It means the more available energy you have from NAD, the more energy you have to kickstart the fat burning process at a cellular level. Next up is mitophagy. There was a 2024 study that found that resistance training flat out increased the autophagy that is specific to the mitochondria. Meaning if you have dysfunctional mitochondria, it's creating dysfunctional patterns and creating dysfunctional DNA leakage essentially and not producing energy. Imagine if you could take that mitochondria, recycle it and feed it to itself to make it stronger. That's what mitophagy is. It's a cellular recycling that's happening specifically at the mitochondrial level. So when you are training in resistance training, your body is actually eating some of the unused components of the mitochondria and turning it into stronger mitochondria, basically trying to make the process more efficient by getting rid of decrepit mitochondria that doesn't have a place. Now, I also put a link down below for an interesting compound called urolithin A from a company called Timeline. That's a 10% off discount link, urolithin A is one of the only compounds that has been researched and published in multiple peer-reviewed journals and clinical trials to induce mitophagy in a similar way to resistance training. So resistance training, building muscle on top of using something like urolithin A could really improve mitophagy. This is real stuff, this is not made up. Like, I don't know if you know Dr. Gabrielle Lyons, she's very well respected in the longevity industry and the longevity community. She's a huge fan of urolithin A and timeline in the first place. So that link down below is for urolithin A capsules or a powder. It's usually derived from pomegranates, but what's interesting is that most humans don't have the ability to convert the compounds in pomegranates into what is called a postbiotic form of urolithin A. So interestingly enough, the patented MitoPure technology with Timeline allows urolithin A to be available to everyone that takes it, which is cool because there's a huge metabolic benefit. So that link is down below. Again, 10% off using that code and that link in the top line of the description. Next up is the myokines. Okay, maybe you've heard of cytokines before or cytokines, potato, potato. Cytokines are produced by the immune system, right? Like cytokines are inflammatory markers. Well, myokines are even some of the same markers. It's just when they're secreted by the muscle, they have a different action than if they're secreted by the immune system. So for example, interleukin-6, when secreted by the immune system, triggers an inflammatory response that is not necessarily good, or it's necessary, but it's not always good. And it goes in tandem with what's called TNF-alpha, and it goes in tandem with what's called interleukin-1-beta generally. When IL-6 is secreted by a muscle in response to resistance training, it actually has beneficial effects because it is in response to an energy stressor rather than an actual pathogenic stressor or a food stressor. So huge, huge difference. So myokines being secreted when we actually resistance train has one of the most profound effects on our body it, that basically marinates our cells and our tissues in things that are training our bodies to become stronger. Also, 
increases in what is called interleukin-10, which is an anti-inflammatory cytokine, or in this case, a myokine. And then a really wild one, a myokine called IL-15, secreted by muscle when we exercise with resistance training, literally helps convert white fat into brown fat. So unusable storage form fat into metabolically active fat and increases anabolism, so increases muscle growth. So we know that you know resistance training increases muscle growth, but we didn't realize that simply by training our quadriceps, we could marinate our entire body in IL-15 that could trigger anabolism throughout the whole body. Pretty fascinating stuff. Next, there was a study published in Applied Physiology and Nutrition. It was rodent model, but they electronically stimulated the muscles of rodents to see how it would impact the mitochondria within the muscles. They were mainly looking at the effect of mitochondrial fusion and fission, which basically is, in, in this case, we're looking more so at like how does the structural integrity and the actual quality of the mitochondria improve. What they found is that the quality of the mitochondria didn't really improve much after what one weight training session, but after four weeks, there were increases in the proteins associated with mitochondrial fusion. With mitochondrial fusion, it means you're basically getting stronger, higher quality mitochondria. So what this tells us is that it's a long-term effect with resistance training. Why does this matter? Like, why do you care? Because once again, now we don't just have more mitochondria. We don't just have more efficient mitochondria. We literally have structurally stronger mitochondria that can withstand the tests of time and all kinds of tribulation. Next is a thermogenesis piece. This one is fascinating because it was published in scientific reports. Again, it was rodent model, but it's interesting. What they found is that when they gave mice a high fat diet to try to induce obesity, they either had them do resistance training or no resistance training. What they found is that the resistance training decreased the expression of lipogenic enzymes. So independent of the whole calorie thing, the mice were less likely to store fat because they had less of the actual lipogenic enzymes that would store fat in the first place. So independent of calories, they also had an increase in those browning-related genes that we've talked about. The browning-related genes are the genes that turn white fat into brown fat. Why does that matter? Because eventually brown fat becomes metabolically active and actually burns calories as heat. This is very, very important because the more brown fat that we have, the more energy we just burn at rest. And the last thing that I'll mention here is the simple hormetic stress piece. When you expose yourself to resistance training, it is one of the most intense hormetic stressors that you could create for yourself. Sitting in a cold plunge is great, but that's a central nervous system shock too. Resistance training is a massive hormetic stressor across the body that triggers all kinds of different hormonal, biochemical, mitochondrial cascades that we are just now starting to scratch the surface of. Exposing ourselves to stress does increase resilience. There's a big difference between resistance training stress and aerobic stress. Aerobic stress is great for us, but resistance training stress does something different that is more long-term and allows our cells to, again, I use that word, marinate in myokines, exerkines, and these things that actually change our cell biology. So as always, keep it locked in here on my channel. I'll see you tomorrow.